So Golam is the uh, next participant, yep. number four. Yes, hello. Hello, my friend. Okay, Golam. Right. So you're in theatre. You've just done this, um, uh, a couple of revision cases recently. So your SHO has, said, has asked you about the scoring that they've, no he's, that he, they've noticed on, um, on these implants. So what do you understand by this? And, um, 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 and what you will explain to the SHO? So th this is a uh, 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 explant of the prosthesis, and uh, so it sh shows that um, it's um, uh, more modular, and uh, uh, and the head, and also the the, the neck. So there is tronosis uh, uh, can happen, which uh, because of the socket and the taper uh, neck of the prosthesis. So, and um, the well, as what can type you just, of taper is it that we have in these trunnions? Um, uh, we, we have a, um, a taper that uh, to fix, uh, uh, and uh, so the, the 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 proximal part or, uh, or the end is uh, more smaller than the uh, the, the the base, mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, uh, to, to fix it, but uh, still there is sometimes they get uh, micro motion, which uh, causes the fritting uh, uh, and causes the, the problem, uh, which is called uh, tetranonosis. Okay, so when you get this micro motion, what can be, a, what can cause this? What can we do to prevent this sort of micro motion that we as surgeons can do? Yeah, the, the micro motion can be uh, prevented if we using the monoblock, which there is no, but of course that we, has... Uh, we, tend to use, we tend to use modular a lot now. How can we as surgeons prevent our modular implants having this problem? Yeah, the, I mean, I mean the, yes, but uh, the monoblock has um, its own disadvantages, but uh, uh, the, 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 we can use this to match it uh, exactly. Uh, and what the... Pro, the, what the uh, the, the the company or the rip uh, is uh, telling us that uh, the exact uh, uh, taper to go to that head, and also the the the, the material should be uh, compatible to and not causes any uh, galvanic uh, uh, problem. So galvanic, what do you understand by galvanic? Uh, galvanic is uh, there is uh, uh, different uh, charges. Uh, and this uh, happened due to dissimilar uh, metals uh, combination, uh, and then uh, then there the, the, the causes uh, erosion and uh, causes uh, um, the because of the, the dissimilarity the onions and the curtains, uh, so they they, they are not uh, compatible, so they are causing the, uh, more erosion uh, on the implant. Okay. And in terms of with um, uh, other things that could cause wear with it between the two part between the two surfaces, um, what could that what what could be potential sources of that? The 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 the, the wear is uh, it's uh, the wear is different types. There is abrasion and adhesive uh, and uh, the third particle. Okay, and specifically with this, what what sort of particles could potentially Get in between the two surfaces. But in this one, the, 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 there may be some uh, uh, there is lack of oxygen is coming, and then once the 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 uh, the sorry, F oxygen. F sorry, Colin. Sorry, you, did you say oxygen? Uh, yes, and also the, yeah, I I I not understand. You mean uh, what? What is the type of? Okay, uh, so uh, the, well, the, let's stop there, shall we? Because we've been four or five minutes now. So, uh, how do you think it went, Gullen? Um I, I I didn't really understand the question, to be honest. Uh, to what you were expecting me to say, but uh, I I thought that you are talking about the taper and the 
Yeah, um, so we'll talk about the taper. Okay. Thank you. But what went well from your point of view? You talked about the taper. Mm. Anything else you felt went well? Uh, well, I I mentioned some, but uh, it was very randomly, isn't it? So let's take a little positive go on. So you talked about the taper, yes. Um, you mentioned also trolleynosis as well. So yeah. what we're talking about trolleynosis, it's a it's a big issue with modular hip replacement with modular implants full stop. Um, yeah. It's something that we still haven't quite got to grips with. So it, it, it is a potential source for problems in the future uh, in terms of revision. So we've got these sort of scorings here. Okay. Okay. So um, what could have gone better, Gullen? Yeah. Uh, I, I think you asked me that uh, that uh, what kind of taper, but I, I was not sure what to say because taper is taper. But uh, maybe yeah, maybe there is. You, you did mention it, so this is what we call Morse taper. Morse okay, so, so in essence, when in this situation, the key thing is talking about trinosis. So we, yeah. you did mention galvanic, so electrochemical transfer between dissimilar metals. So we try and avoid that fretting. So corrosion of micro, uh, relative micromotion between two materials. So tolerance between male and female Morse tapers and possible taper mismatch. Quite right, you mentioned that with regards to ensuring that we have the correct, the correct taper um, template. Crevice, physiochemical interaction between metal and the environment leading to altered mechanical properties. What do we do? You know, when you put a hemi off for plasty or you put the, 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 the total hip head on, First thing you do before you put it on is you give the tunion a good clean to make sure there's no blood on it. That's to stop this sort of physiochemical reaction happening. Okay. Yes. So it's about making sure we have there's nothing on on the taper, right? Okay. So, um, yes, the more taper is mismatch. So we've got twelve fourteen, which is what we use standard. It's really important though. Different companies have different ideas of what a twelve fourteen is. So your Dupuy 1214 will be different to your um, your Furlong 1214, which I've I've seen happen where people put the wrong one in, and it yeah it does not go it does not go well. Yes. So we're talking about the opening diameter and yeah. the closing diameter. So that's the opening diameter, and that's the closing. And funny enough, <laughs> this is the male part of the taper. Yeah. This is the female part of the taper. Yes. We are, all, well, yeah, you can tell that orthopedic surgeons are, are mainly men. Um, but as I say, so yeah, so it's, it, is a, it is key about that. And if you want to know the angle, this will, it's this angle here is 1.49. 1 but that's, a, that's, that's the difference between different implant, different companies actually. Um, so it's really key, as I say, to make sure you get those right. All right. Okay. But, I it's a question to try and get you to talk about uh, where, in particular galvanic, where, um, so where are we going? So galvanic, fretting, and crevice. So we need you, so you did talk a bit about galvanic. You understood what that was, like, like electrochemical transfer between the similar metals. You mentioned a bit about micromotion, so that's good. So that's really key. So making sure you've got the right, miss, the right um, male and female tapers. So, in terms of improving, I want you to be a bit more precise with your language, if you can, um, and that's a case again of practicing. Okay, that's how we can get better, isn't it, isn't it, Colin? But you're doing yes. really well. Okay, so don't yeah. so don't just be disarmed. You actually said quite a lot in there, which was right. Okay, which I'm which I'm really happy with. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank um, you very much. Nice, God. Okay. So what, when are you doing next week? Yes. Good. Good. All right. All the, best, All the best, Colin. All the best. Okay, excellent, thank you. excellent question. Thank you, David. Excellent question. Good question. So we'll um, move on now to number five. Uh, Ajay, I think. Is... Uh, sorry, yeah, I, I, I'm not jumping the gun to the rest, but yes, next question. <laughs> okay, so Simon, where are you? Yep, yeah, hi. Good morning, Simon. Hi, Simon. Right. So congratulations. I'll, you're uh, the new academic consultant. Um, can you tell me for a hip surgery? Can you tell me about the perfect bearing surface? So a perfect uh, bearing surface would be one with uh, uh, which is inert, which is not uh, does not uh, produce any considerable wear particles, which are active especially, and uh, that it has a good um, hardness and uh, quality profile, 
which is not susceptible to uh, wear or oxidative stress, and uh, that uh, um, can uh, can can serve uh, for a long period of time. And what sort of two surfaces have we got here? So these are two bearing surfaces. The one on the left shows a ceramic on polyethylene, while the one on the right uh, shows a metal um, a metal head with a metal shell. Yeah, it should be metal metal. Okay. We, we couldn't, there was too damaged to, 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 to extract properly. Right, okay. So what's the difference between metal and uh, metal and metal? Why did we try metal and metal? Uh, so metal and metal prostheses, uh, um, had a good, have a good track record as they provide uh, less uh, sorry wear particles which are uh, smaller in size and less susceptible to uh, um, uh, wear and uh, wear uh, and the OP activation of the uh, a good track record or a bad track record so they have, they have a good track record regarding wear however they might lead to uh, other problems such as a pseudo tumors um, What's a pseudo tumor? So, a pseudo tumor is um, a, a, a type of alba lesion, which is a aseptic vasculitic uh, lesion, which, uh, which uh, as the name implies, does not trigger an infective process. However, it activates macrophages and, uh, and causes uh, soft tissue tumors which can. Which can uh, Lead to soft tissue to destruction of the local tissues uh, in the in, in around the hip joint. Sorry, um, there are yeah. specific uh, guidelines about the MHRA criteria for uh, specific procedures of metal on metals, which uh, are used in daily practice, uh, and uh, these include a yearly uh, iron count, uh, cobalt and chromium. The, and a yearly Oxford hip score, and uh, also uh, review to see if the patient is symptomatic if, or not. If uh, they are in a high group or a low group, um, it depends on the rate of follow up. If the patient becomes symptomatic or in a high group, um, Mars uh, or uh, metal artificial reduction sequence MRI. Good. So, going back, Simon, so tell me, you mentioned um, so the, the, the metal metal is supposed to be with perfect way bearing surface, but why do we get these small um, sort of small particles forming? Is there a problem with how we're doing this? So how we're doing metal metal um, bearing surfaces? So uh, the ideal procedure would be that of a smooth surface. However, um, these are prone to this, uh, the, surf, the notch sensitivity, as we mentioned before, might lead to uh, asperities and these asperities might uh, uh, produce wear particles, which uh, Again, um, wear off or uh, decrease the the articular surface surfaces, uh, producing these small particles. And uh, these can these can be the wear can be either from uh, as the uh, as the manufacturer intended to be. So with a, a type one wear, the type two is between a articulating and non articulating uh, surface. Type three is third body wear, so for example. If there are fragments of cement or bone in the joint affected joint space, and uh, type four would be that of uh, between two non-articulating surfaces. Okay, and um, so we mentioned also ceramic. Uh, uh, or so tell me what, what's the benefit? The benefits of ceramic and poly. So ceramics ceramics have uh, some uh, properties which uh, are beneficial, such as they are very wettable as the. Uh, when again mentioned before, there is a fluid film around the, pro the, the bearing surface, which enables it to, uh, uh, for better lubrication, increasing coefficient of friction. They are uh, hard, so that's a surface properties. They, they do not form asperities as readily as the uh, metal part. And uh, uh, that's fine. Okay. Let's say, have a breather there. Okay, Simon. Okay, how do you think that went? Um, I felt disjointed, but I tried to pick up by filling in with some uh, uh, things such as the modes of wear and the prop surface properties. Uh, and uh, okay, 
Do we so you covered quite a lot there. So positives, tell me the positives. Yeah, so yeah exactly. Um, so we covered quite a lot. We went through a lot, uh, maybe not. Uh, um, yeah, it was about, it was flowing and uh, mentioned most of the things, I think. Good, okay. So yeah, you did go, I was very pleased. You talked a lot. Um, you talked about different things, low uh, wettability, toughness, hardness. You mentioned all the key things I wanted to talk about, I wanted you to mention, um, which is why actually I didn't actually have to say much, which is great. I love that's what examiners want to do. They don't want to have to talk. Um, if they have to talk, they're just trying to bring you back onto 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 the scheme um, or just or just probing your knowledge. Okay. So actually your knowledge was pretty good. Um, so I was very pleased with that. Don't obviously what happened the real thing, uh, but don't mention as we discussed earlier. <laughs> Yeah. So this is a new question, nothing happened before, so, so to speak. Um, but yes, but overall, very pleased with, the, with, how, you, with how you answered that. Uh, in terms of better, uh, how you could improve, how do you think you could improve, Simon? I think it felt a bit disjointed and not flowing enough. I didn't get to that sort of steady flowing phase when you really know something, I guess, but uh, covered most of it, I guess. When's the exam for you, Simon? Next week. Next week. So again, it's just a little bit of structure. That's fine. We'll need a bit of structure. Don't worry about that. Um, practice it. Practice talking. That's the key thing. So you've got you've got the week to bore your uh, uh, your your uh, other half silly or your and your study partners silly with different topics. So this week you should just be talking, talking, talking to talking the hind leg off a, off a donkey, um, and that will help. Trust me, it will help on the day. So um, it's just the idea of talking about these concepts, and that's often. Coming on courses like this allows you to give you an opportunity to discuss that in a non-threatening environment, hopefully. Um, but actually, yes, as I say, I was very good amount of knowledge, very key that lots of good knowledge there. And as I say, yes, structure could be better, but that's uh, that's a minor point. Um, so I mean, in reality, if you covered the key things I would have covered um, with it in terms of uh, so characteristics, perfect very surface, durable, combined properties of wear, friction, lubrication, which you mentioned straight away. Low coefficient fiction, again, fantastic. Um, uh, and we talked a bit about metal and metal. So be careful about saying it's a, in an ideal world, it's supposed to be a fantastic bearing mm -hmm. surface, but in reality, it didn't end up being a. a, 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 a. And a lot of that's due to, um, uh, as you said, about expertise, miss. But also, one thing we, we don't really talk about, but actually is really key, we understand there's a fantastic talk on Author Academy about where. By our, by our colleagues, um, so go re, go watch that on the YouTube channel, and he describes the re, the problems with metal and metal, and it's the mismatch. So it's the fact that you need to have a little bit of mismatch with the cup and the head, um, but they're all, if they're too perfect or they or they get trapped, you get sort of pinching, and that creates those that sort of wear problem. Okay, so as I say, he described it brilliantly on his in his talk. So to, uh, advise you go. Well, if, you, if you're bored and you wanted to watch a YouTube channel, watch that one. Um, but because there's some very important wear and tribology concepts in that as well. And you can watch that at your leisure. And he, he describes it really well with fantastic sort of key explanations and nice simple terms. Okay. okay. Uh, so you mentioned about metals and the properties of metal ceramics, which I was very happy with. Um, so good hardness, scratch resistance, adhesive wear, ability to, to self heal. Yep. Um, yeah, but as I say, overall, really good. That was a strong. That was a strong answer for my, in my opinion. So I'm not. I'm not. Wasn't worried, Simon, from that point of view, uh, which is why I let you carry talk, and I just going to to highlight a few points, which is what we want to see. Okay. Thank you. So, um, and as with everyone, the exam in the next week or so, I do recommend practice talking through basic sciences. We don't talk basic science all the time. You talk clinical stuff a lot, but with your colleagues, with your study groups, discuss different concepts. And it really important with basic science is try and see if you can apply them in a clinical scenario. That's what the exams want, the examiners want you to get to at the end of your answer. Okay, that's what I was trying to do with a lot of these questions, applying them in a clinical scenario, which is really key thing that pushes you. If you can get the, you can get the bit, if you can regurgitate the textbook stuff, it's a good six. If you can get to a clinical scenario, apply it in the clinical scenario, you're pushing seven, eight. Okay. So, and if you can use those key concepts like ground reaction forces, how they work and how it works for someone walking using an AFO splint, 
that's what they want to see okay um and again likewise talking about tribology in terms of how it works for us as surgeons why it's important for us as surgeons again a really key concept um and likewise as well um what else did i talk about yeah so consent as well so think about some of the lesser topics such as the medical ethics and consent because there will always be a question like that they will always throw either orthotics or an ethics question or a, uh, in there. So just don't ignore them. Do read them. You don't have to read them in depth, but don't ignore them, okay? Because they will turn up. All right. Um, I don't think, I think that's me done, isn't it? For us, is there anything else you want to That's add? it. You're done, uh, David. Brilliant one. And thank you for sticking to time. Uh, much appreciated, David. I think you covered um, quite a lot within one hour. You can't cover the whole but first basic science is no way that needs a whole week but uh, you've done very well david thank you very much okay. and yes so that's you guys later in the afternoon for a clinical okay. upper clinical yes uh, david is going to join us later on in the day yes for the upper clinical um, sessions upper limb clinical sessions sorry hi morning hi, morning you. are you joining audio only only no, no, I, I'm, I'm here. Oh, hi, Sunny. Yeah, hi. Uh, I think I can't remember your face. I don't know if you just hear this. Anyway, so my name is Mehta. I'm one of the uh, faculty here. So this is uh, right ring finger injured while playing basketball. Can you please interpret this uh, with the graph? Uh, you say this is uh, a lateral x-ray of the uh, ring finger it demonstrates the volar subluxation of yeah. the two uh, i can't see any associated fracture uh, with that as well i'd like to clinically assess this patient uh, with the history and examination i'd like to um find out uh his hand dominance um age as well as occupation and then i'd like to find out more about the exact mechanism of the injury uh, is right hand dominant uh university student and he injured his, his, his uh, right finger uh, okay. while playing basketball. Okay, okay. No, it's uh, a closed injury. Okay, yeah, so that's his own examination, just checking it's closed neurovascularly intact. Everything um, is fine, yeah. Okay. He's in pain only. Okay, fine, fine. Um, in this case, um, my initial uh, management would be to uh, reduce this in the accident emergency department. Um, I would uh, gain verbal consent and apply a ring block um, and uh, apply uh, gentle traction in order to, to reduce this. Okay, you managed to reduce it nicely. And okay. what, what is your concern about this patient? How will you fix or stabilize the, 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 the joint or the finger? So um, I'm concerned about the possibility of uh, central slip injury. Um, and so I would, um, in the initial um, kind of setting, I, I would check the stability in flexion extension. If it's stable, then I would um, place it into a body splint and then see him in clinic in order to assess the central slip because it might it will probably be very okay. swollen. So what do you anticipate from dorsal dislocation of, of, uh, of the joint? What you anticipate for volar dislocation of the joint? Uh, I think it's um, dorsal. Do you, do you think they are the same pathology or same? You know, so so um, you're more likely to get a, a volar plate um, injury with, with the, the with the dorsal dorsal the, dislocation. Yeah, and and then um, and then a central slip with the volar dislocation. Okay, so. With this one, central slip. So this is, a, you, I think you, I, I would like to give you another scenario because this is a very short one, but this is very important. Okay. With, with the central slip, be careful. You don't mobilize with body strapping. We have to mobilize in extension for some time, okay? It okay. Is, it is the central slip, part of the uh, accessory mechanism. You, any tendon you need to, like Achilles tendon, you have to put it in the So this one, yeah. you need to put in extension. Okay, so six weeks till it heals. Uh, if it, it's coming with a bony, bony fragment, you should fix it surgically. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is important because everyone is giving body strapping and send home. No, you should be different from others. You should know that this is the, the, the treatment of this kind of illness. Okay. Okay. I, I assume you know how, if you can take a screenshot of this one, because I, got, I would like to give you another, another quick one. Okay. Okay. So this is. Uh, 
as, as it mentioned here, extension, then hand therapy will start gradually after six weeks to, to regain the function of the PID. Okay, it is important to know that. With the, with the dorsal stification, you should do the other way around. Start early mobilization to stop the stiffness and flexion because of the volar volar Okay. Okay. This, you know. Different, huh? So this is a lateral X-ray of a, a finger. It demonstrates a bony avulsion of the dis, um, of the dorsal aspect of the base of the distal phalanx. Um, it's significantly uh, displaced, and the um, uh, distal phalanx is held in Which a flat part is position. significantly displaced. Uh, the so the bony avulsion is is displaced. Okay, and uh, uh, if if I say the other way around, would you agree? Uh, is it this, this? Can you see that? If you, if, sorry, I, I don't know if you can see the, the, the arrow here. If you draw a line like that here, this line should be going to the phalanx here. So yeah, this one uh, is it's the phalanx is oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, sorry. Yes, yeah, so, so the the distal phalanx is has subluxed foliar as well. Um, again, I'd like to as assess this patient clinically. Uh, uh, asking for the same questions, hand dominance, age and okay. occupation, and any relevant past medical history. If this is a closed neurovascularly intact injury in the closed initial injury, index finger, uh, she's tied this played it, injured it during playing netball. Okay. And she needs treatment now. Okay. Um, I think in, in the um, initial setting, I'd try to reduce this and apply a mallet splint. Oh. I would, with a mallet splint and um, a and uh, check on x-ray to see if it has been reduced, but this is likely to be an unstable um, injury. And I think this would likely require a... Um, How will you anticipate is, is stability of this uh, joint? Um, you know, any, any ratio of injury or any... any... So I, th I think it's, it's more, more than 30% of the... Of the, are, you guessing, of the, are you guessing or are you, are you sure about that? I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but it, it looks so, like it's more than 30% of the articular surface has been involved. If you would like to treat conservatively, how much a degree of the uh, splint you will, you will put it? I put it myself, or physiotherapy, not to do it. Don't, don't say the medical splint, which is uh, just to stop or anything like that. How do you put the splint? You, you try to put it in hyperextension or neutral or flexion or what? Uh, well, I, I, I would have thought neutral. Okay, and where to put it in dorsal or in volar? Uh, on the on the on the so the mallet sprint just goes on over the top. So oh, okay, so put it on the volar side to avoid it from flexing. Okay. You tried you tried conservative, but it's still the same. How what's your management? You accept that? Uh, no, so so it's likely to result in a um, uh, so it, it's 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 uh, likely to result in poor function that way. So um, in terms of what, what is a poor function if it is long standing mallet? What will happen? So um, inability to fully extend um, yes. the finger. Anything uh, any any long term impact on the finger since the mechanism. Uh, it can lead to a swan neck deformity as well. Okay. Um, yes. And uh, surgically, what options do you do surgically? So um, I think fixation with uh, KYs would... Uh, How do you fix it? Well, you, you could reduce the bony fragment with a KY in place. Do you know any technique or anything? Because it's not like this terribus. This has uh, different techniques. Do you know any technique about it? I think it's an, a dorsal blocking kind of wire uh, that's applied. Uh, yes. Okay, I think now, I don't know the time, but it seems we got in, in process right. What do you okay. think? Yeah, I think I'd need to revise this again. To... Uh, Faraz, do you want to say something? No, that's 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 great one. That's, that's good questions. Um, I had this question and I missed it. I missed it in my exam, by the way. Uh, I asked about the size of the wire. I said 
still uh, not realistic size, and he, he draw the, 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 the size and say you will not be able to do this one. To use a side with the wire, if you would like to do blocking wires, this is just the smallest wire, maybe you eight or 1.1, okay? Don't say 1.6, please. 1.6 in this area is massive. There is classification. Uh, there is classification. Richard, stop, sorry. Uh, I would show you a classification quickly about this one here. If you can take a screenshot, this will give you maybe uh, more marks with, than others. We can't see anything at the moment. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing yeah, it. That's maybe. fine. Okay, yeah. sorry about that. Sorry. No, it's fine. Uh, can you see this one? Can you see this? This yeah. are two classification. Just remember one of them. They are useful if you say classification. So we try conservative treatment. Majority of them will be done. Uh, Conservatively, and uh, the rest will be for surgical. As you said, remember the extension block. Don't say open reduction in this situation. This is not a, a very uh, a good option. I, 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 I rarely do it. It is not advisable, okay? Any questions? 78 year old gentleman who fell down in garden and sustained this injury. What can you see? An AD radiograph of the left uh, uh, hip showing a, a total hip replacement, uh, all cemented with a periprostatic fracture, uh, Vancouver uh, type uh, B. Uh, yeah. Um, I would like to assess uh, this uh, patient. I cannot comment if the implant is uh, stable or not to say if it is uh, a B2 or a B3. Uh, uh, however, uh, there is a good bone stock, uh, but I don't think the stem is in place, so it is a B2. I'd like to assess this patient uh, clinically, uh, ASAP. I uh, will take a history about the fall, any other associated injury, like a head injury. Uh, and I would like uh, to um, take a history about past medical history, especially concentrating of, and uh, she's on steroids, any blood thinning drugs uh, to optimize her. Uh, ideally, uh, uh, also uh, check the locally about if there is any signs of uh, uh, um, affection of the soft tissue, distal neurovascular status. And yeah, uh, so you're going to take a history, all right? So, yeah. what are the risk factors in history for getting uh, periprostatic fractures? Uh, risk factors, uh, it might be uh, uh, something like a, a fall from a standing height can lead to a periprostatic fracture if the implant is affected or uh, if, the, uh, if there is a twisting kind of an uh, injury, um, if there is an uh, infection that leads to osteolysis of the uh, uh, implant and this has predisposed to the implant being weak, arising to a periprostatic fracture. This is a worst okay. case. Okay. So you told me some time back about Vancouver. So what is Vancouver classification? The classification of a periprostatic fracture uh, type A is uh, related to uh, type AG for the greater trochanter avulsion fraction or AL for a lesser trochanter. Type B is uh, according to the implant fixation and the bone stock uh, while B1 is good implant still in place and bone stock uh, is fine. It's a minimal undisplaced fracture. Uh, B2 is implant is moving, but a good bone stock. B3 implant is moving at a bad bone stock. And C is a fracture distal to the stem. Okay. Uh, so what you're going to do now? You said there is a uh, periprosthetic fracture yeah. in this patient. Uh, What's your management? Ideally, I would like also to have a, a, a CT scan with a metal subtraction if possible to assess for the bone quality and to plan my uh, surgery. Uh, based on it, uh, it uh, uh, will be uh, with this kind of fracture with the age of the patient, uh, it will be uh, according to the uh, bone stock and the appearance uh, of the soft tissue to be either to fix it with uh, 
uh, a cable plate and the screws rising from a proximal end to uh, about four centimeter below the fracture side. Uh, so as uh, to avoid stress riser or uh, to do uh, a revision, uh, revision uh, diaphyseal pit uh, 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 stem with a so you got problem. No, you got two options, either fix it or replace it. What are you going to do? Uh, uh, for this patient, according to the liability, according to the bonus stock, I'll be eager to fix it. Fix it. And yes. uh, why, why would you fix it? Why not replace it? Because it is um, uh, uh, the implant here. Uh, actually, this patient, um, there is, uh, I can see also, I, I just uh, uh, bring my uh, answer back. I can see there is some loosening around the proximal fragment uh, around the, uh, the shoulder of the stem with some loosening also on the inframedial, uh, in the superior medial part. Uh, so I think this might be a, a, a predisposing factor for a being fractured. So I will be replacing it. You would be replacing it. Okay. Yes. All right. So you think that uh, the uh, the stem is loose, isn't it? Yes. So what approach will you use? Uh, uh, I will uh, be using. Uh, um, I'm aware. That, uh, I will be using an extended lateral approach. Okay, and, uh, I think your time is up, Sharif. So uh, let's go to the uh, slides again and uh, we'll just read it for you, okay? So when you saw this, uh, uh, can you see the slides? Next slide. Yeah. About assessment, Sharif. So, so you should say this is a periprosthetic fracture of left hip, all right? In one line, hip replacement. So how are going to assess is you to see how did this problem happen? Okay, what is bothering him and what has been done for it? So these three questions you have to address first. About risk factors of de developing this, these factors can happen because of uh, inadequate technique like under rimming or using a bigger stem or bone itself is weak because of osteoporosis or if there's a later wear and tear or sometimes infection. Okay, uh, so in history, these are the risk factors, but you have to ask generally some uh, history, which is important, like uh, whether any perioperative complications like uh, wound lick out, wash out or course of antibiotics. Was this hip replacement a happy hip? In the sense, patient walked comfortably for years together and suddenly this happened or this to give him pain and dull ache some for years together. This, this is very important history because it uh, gives you the, the plan of treatment. So once you uh, uh, take a history, this is a relevant history pertinent to the case, you go, go to examination. You say, I'll examine as per ATLS principle and show the patient is safe, does not have any other injuries. You will examine the limb. So how you examine limb? You look for the scar and see if there's signs of infection there. You feel where is the local tenderness and assess compartment, distal neurovascular status, okay? So next step, if you see the patient and you follow the framework is you're going to provide him, admit him, provide him analgesia and DVT prophylaxis, okay? And this is not a very uh, straightforward case. You might be a hip surgeon when you're again going to exam, uh, you are a general surgeon, general orthopedic surgeon. So you say, I would, uh, uh, this, this, is, this is a complex case, I would take a second opinion, but principles of the treatment are this. If the stem is uh, loose, which you cannot make out on x-ray, then you replace it. If stem is uh, well fixed, then you fix it and augment it with a long yellow grafts, all right? Uh, you can do, you need to mention that you will do FPC CRP to rule out any infection. It's an important factor. X-rays, you like two ways. Some people for more information will get CTs. But one valid point to tell that even if you feel it needs fixation, you'll say that I'll keep backup replacement because whether it's B2 or B3, you can, most of people 
sometimes you can only make out in the operation theater because on the x-ray it might be no osteolytic lines nothing but in theater it's completely loose so you have to get back up for uh, the theater and that would that that's what you would actually do thank you uh, so i would I just uh, want to uh, to ask something because you're saying it to do a crp to check if there is uh, signs of infection mr kamat however mm. if a patient who is a trauma uh, her crp will no, uh, no, no, be raised no no see uh, uh, sharif either you can sustain trauma and fall or you can fall and sustain trauma in this patient patient fell and then got fracture all right okay so it's it's uh, it might be pathological isn't it the, the way i'm describing it so like some sometimes you might drive in a you might sustain trauma and get fracture or you might get fracture and fall you're with me yeah yeah okay you might fall and get fracture or get fracture and fall so it's two different one thing is traumatic one second thing is pathological you got the difference isn't it yeah yeah you have passed this station uh, sharif but you know there are these are very important points which you have to really tell and if you go to what i have told you and go in that stream that leads to 7 or 8 and uh, so the 7 or 8 you can get only when you ask for second opinion if you don't it's a problem uh, approach you'll take will be in consideration of with the previous approach which surgeon has taken generally isn't it yeah you might change but uh, you say i will just see what was the previous approach taken so points to learn in this that in history you have to about apart from general history you have to ask whether it was happy hip or not number one number two perioperative complications mm. in examination it tells protocol you didn't mention you have to mention that okay examining the part and distal neurovascular status okay and in management primary management you should say i will provide analgesia yeah, dvt prophylaxis definitive management i'll ask for second opinion but principles of management are these mm. and then when examiner runs out of question you score 7 plus mm. Any Thank questions? You. Any questions from your side? Thank you very much. Mm. So now, Vancor classification. You said A, B, C. Do you know to subclassify it? Uh, I I subclassified. Yeah. So there is a further subclassification into one, two, three. I Means one is cortical penetration, B is incomplete fracture, and C is complete fracture. Three is complete fracture. i will read about this now oh, yeah 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 so either of this abc can be either cortical perforation or incomplete fracture or complete fracture okay thank you so can you tell me revise me in uh, two minutes what i have said yes yeah, so uh, what i have said that initially uh, while assessing the patient i would need to check if it it was a happy hip or an unhappy hip um i would need to match this patient initially according to atls protocol after excluding there is any other uh, life threatening or limb threatening injury i would like to check locally uh, if there is uh, check the wound uh, the surgical wounds that she had any signs of infection uh, locally uh, any bruising the distal neurovascular status of the limb and the compartments uh, then i will uh, uh, need to uh, check from the history uh, about the uh, uh, the complications that has happened as i said if uh, any antibiotics uh, uh, that is used in uh, uh, post operatively or uh, uh, as i said it, it is a happy hip then initially i would like to uh, do uh, 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 check the patient biomechanically by having bloods including full blood count esr crp uh, group and save and uh, to have an x-ray and ct scan i would like also to be aware that might be an infection uh, going on there uh this patient needs to be given the appropriate analgesia before starting uh, to have any of this investigation or movement for an x-ray or a ct scan uh, plus or minus fascia iliaca block and then uh most most probably discuss with this patient about that you need a surgical management 
However, I will be discussing it with uh, uh, our MDT team to have a second opinion about uh, the appropriate management, which will be uh, uh, according also to the CT scan. However, the principles generally will be either to replace or uh, to fix it uh, uh, according to the bonus stock and after discussing in MDT. The approach that I'm going to use will be the uh, will be uh, most probably the approach that she had the total hip replacement done with it before, uh, but this is liable to change uh, as it is needed. Sticking with pediatrics, <laughs> we've got a two-year-old girl and she's been sent to your clinic with a fixed flexion deformity of her thumb. So I've got some pictures here. So I'd like you to tell me about what you can see and, and what you know about this condition, and then we can talk about what we're going to do about it. So these are clinical photographs of the uh, two-year-old girl's left thumb uh, showing uh, a flex, uh, a, sorry, a flexed attitude of the interphalangeal joint. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems like there's also highlighting of a uh, node, a nutter's node. So this would be in keeping with a, uh, a trigger thumb, also known as a congenital trigger thumb. Yep. And uh, yeah, and the uh, the the uh, so yeah, you get the not as node forming in the uh, flexor tendon, and uh, it can get caught in the. So they think that it's either the not as node or it could also be a hypertrophy of the. Uh, a1 pulley or the oblique pulley of the uh, thumb and uh, so then you need to classify this using uh, the Watanabe classification to see if it is a if it's just a triggering of the thumb or whether it's uh, locking and needs to be passively extended or whether it's fixed locked and that cannot be passively extended. Okay, so if this is fixed, what shall we do? So if this is fixed, then, uh, and the child is two years old, then uh, my understanding that, so I would want this to be treated uh, by a pediatric orthopedic team, but the mm -hmm. principles of my management, uh, once it is a fixed uh, trigger thumb would be for, uh, a operative procedure in order to uh, release the A1 pulley. Okay, so talk me through your operation. So uh, in an appropriately marked and consented, uh, so in consenting the parents, obviously, I would uh, have the child under general anesthesia and uh, the hand on a hand table, and I would make a, uh, I would say a longitudinal incision over the over the notter's node. Uh, uh, sorry, I would want to make sure that my incision is more based, more uh, more ulnally, I think, too, so that I avoid the uh, radial uh, the radial neurovascular bundle, mm -hmm. digital bundle, and uh, then I would want to. Uh, want to dissect down onto the pulley to release it, uh, mm -hmm. always being sure not to also release the oblique pulley so I don't get uh, uh, bowstringing of the tendon. I will then ensure that the tendon is running freely when I uh, passively extend the interphalangeal joint and then I'll uh, close the skin and and, uh, and just dress the finger. Okay, and what are the potential complications of this operation? So it's an uh, injury to the, to the uh, radial neurovascular bundle of the digit, as well as uh, injury to the tendon as you're doing it, in, uh, over release of uh, further pulleys, including the oblique pulley, which could result in bowstringing. Uh, other things would be recurrence of the trigger thumb, as well as 
uh, infection uh, yeah. area. Man. Yeah. Okay. All right. And just quickly, um, uh, tell me what the pathophysiology is of the pediatric trigger thumb compared with the adult trigger finger. Um, uh, so I, in an adult trigger finger, you would get, uh, so you'd get, you know, synovitis developing. And so that causes the inflammation within the uh, tendon and the blocking. Whilst in a pediatric trigger finger, the notter's node, uh, I can't remember exactly how it develops, to be honest. Okay. All right, that's five minutes. So how do you think you how do you think you did? Uh, so I felt it started well because I, I felt I knew what I was looking at, but uh, and I kind of had a good idea of the classification and thing, but I felt I then struggled a bit when it came to uh, the details of the management. Um no, I think you did well. I think you did well. Let's just go through it. So um, you're right. Flexion of the IP joint, it starts as a trigger and then it becomes fixed flexion. And in a child, so this is the difference. So in a child, you've got a problem with the FPL tendon. So you get thickening of the tendon due to the abnormal collagen degeneration and synovial preparation which causes an increase in the diameter of the tendon compared with the size of the A1 pulley. So you get disruption of the gliding. Now, as you said, in the adults, they get um, proliferation of the synovial, the tenosynovitis sheath, um, which causes the problem or problems at the A1 pulley themselves. So that's the difference between the two. Um, the knotter's node is where you get the nodule, and we drew that out, I think, and you picked that up quietly. Um, <clears throat> well, when they get to the age of two, it's unlikely to resolve, so we're going to do an A1 pulley release. So even though there's different pathologies for the child and the adults, we're going to do the same operation. Um, you're not the first person to say they're going to do a longitudinal incision. Personally, I would do a transverse incision to try and keep it in the crease and just make sure that I have Ragnall's retractors in to make sure I can see um, <clears throat> where the tendon is, where the pulley is and look out for my um, radial digital nerve. That's the one that normally gets injured. So adverse outcomes, I think you mentioned most of them. Infection, I've not really seen any infections, but it's there. Scar contractures, bowstring of the tendons, FPL rupture, incomplete release is the one that we should think about whenever we talk about um, trigger finger release or trigger thumb release and radial digital nerve injury. All right. A little bit of uh, a paper for you. So here's what you're talking about. So 30 degree deformity, 30 or more degrees. So if there's less deformity, they're more likely to resolve spontaneously than if they're 30 or more degrees of fixed flexion. Um, and for each additional degree, then you reduce the likelihood of spontaneous resolution by 3%. Um, there's no detrimental effects of non-surgical management. So you're quite, you know, each case you're able to do a trial of non-operative treatment. And the idea is that, you know, if you do wait, so if you've got a child of one with a fixed flexion on one side, if you do a trial of non-operative treatment, and they develop one on the other side, then you can treat them both at the same time. Okay, so well done. Any questions? So just to confirm, even if it is fixed flexion, you'd still try to non-operative with physiotherapy and parental stretchings and things if it's fixed. I think if they're, I think if they're under 18 months, it's probably worth it. I think by the time you're getting to 18 months and two years old like this child, it's probably not gonna get better. And I would do a release at this stage. But if they're very young, then there's no there's no side effects of treating it non-operatively to start with. Okay. So the next one I have is a seven year old child fell was playing football and uh, complains of left elbow pain, isolated injury, neurovascularly intact. 
you are seeing this patient in ED department. Proceed, please. So th there is a, a AP and lateral view of uh, X-ray of an immature skeleton. Um, on the AP view, th there is evidence of uh, a bony fracture involving the lateral aspect of the distal humerus, so probably, and on the lateral view, there is subluxation of the, the distal humerus. So I'm thinking there is a fracture of the uh, lateral epicondyle with fracture dislocation. Okay, so how are you going to manage this? So I will uh, get a focus history and, uh, and thinking that it is an isolated injury, I will... Uh, what is the focus history points that you want to ask? So the, the mechanism of injury, while, so it is said while playing, playing football, so what exactly happened, whether he fell directly onto the elbow or there was a, a torsional injury. Um, so mechanism so he of fell on his outfit stretched hand. Yeah, the, the time, timing of injury, when, when, when this happened. Four hours ago. Um, and uh, what, what was done immediately. Um, and um, I would also ask about his uh, past medical history, uh, also ab about his uh, immunization status. And also when he had his last last meal, um, I will then uh, look uh, do a clinical examination to uh, look at the soft tissue envelope uh, to see if it is an open or closed injury. It is closed um, fracture. Um, I will um, do a, a, a neurovascular examination of his elbow. Intact. Yeah, and. Uh, presuming that uh, th because he is only seven year old, I will also uh, um, see who, who who has come with the with the patient, whether it is his parents or the or the coach from the for the from the football ground. Um, okay, so the parents brought him straight away. There is no concern regarding the uh, non accidental injury. Okay. So. What next? Um, so my initial management would be to to. Um, give him pay, adequate pain medication and um, after, after giving him analgesia and if there is a, a, a anesthetic support or pediatric support, then I would give him some sedation to try and reduce the injury and give a above elbow back slab and then do a check x-ray after. Um, I will assess the Post so you mentioned about reducing it. How are you going to do that? So, um, so given that there is more more of a uh, lateral uh, condyle and of capitulum fracture, um, I would give a linear traction and. Try, so the, the, the patient is now in, in, in the elbow is in sorry, virus. So uh, give him linear traction and try and uh, give an opposite direction course. To in, okay, in, in all right. Valgus and you then- you tried that, it, it wasn't successful. So on this AP view, yeah. what do you see? You mentioned about the fracture. Is there anything else which is abnormal? Um, so you mentioned about this part, which is broken, and yeah. I agree with that. Is yeah. there anything else which is abnormal? So um, I, I'm I, I'm thinking that whether the on, 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 whether the, the, the tip of the olecranon has also fractured along with that, uh, but okay. the, the radial head seems to be intact. Yes, okay, so you've tried and you couldn't do anything. You repeated the x-ray, they, they are exactly the same. Now what? So uh, I, I, would, I would discuss this x-ray with my, um, presuming that he is distal neurovascularly intact, I will, I will discuss him with the, my, uh, with the pediatric orthopedic uh, uh, on-call team 
Uh, you are you are the on call consultant and it is yeah. and so the so the, the, the normally happens, isn't it? Yeah. So the the, yeah. the the principle of management would be to initially to to ascertain the fracture pattern. If we have doubt regarding the the fracture pattern, we can uh, request for further imaging, uh, which could be a CT scan of the elbow. We got the CT scan now. So, um, lo so looking at the CT scan, I, I think there is a fragment of the capitulum as well as the, the lateral epicondyle. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure about the radial head and olecranon. Um, okay, so radial head and olecranon, they are intact. So there, there is uh, 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 at least two, two fragments for the, for the lateral condyle. Um, so potentially capitulum and, and um, lateral epicondyle. Um, okay, so, so next. So if uh, I have tried to reduce it uh, in, in a and &E, and if it is not reducing, then I, I would assume that one of the fragment is uh, kind of in, in so, particular. So just to be clear, when you say you try to reduce, what exactly you're trying to reduce? Are you talking about this fracture? Uh, no, the 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 el elbow joint is sublex, so that that is the reason why. I oh, thank you, thank you. That's what I was trying to establish here. Okay, so yeah. all right. So you think there is some disruption in the elbow? So be specific. What part of the elbow joint? So 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 the um, the uh, humero ulnar joint is uh, dislocated. Ulnar humeral joint. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's go back now. So you've tried reduction of the ulnar humeral joint, which was yes. unsuccessful. Yeah. So now what? You've got this imaging. CT scan is being done. Yeah. So, so tell me how you're going to manage this. You've spoken to the patient. You have obtained appropriate consent, and everything is done. The patient is in theatre now. So uh, I, I would I would uh, position the patient supine uh, uh, and. Uh, and uh, he is uh, will uh, can uh, will use a tunique, um, um, but will not inflate it unless required. I will uh, uh, position the patient supine on a on a uh, side, with a side table, uh, uh, um, and um, um, the 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 principle being and have an a, 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 a X ray position so that I can get a three sixty degree. Uh, access to the to the elbow and the the, the principle would be to try it and reduce it close and then uh, fix percutaneously fix the the, the lateral condyle okay um, so uh, once the patient was anesthetized you managed to get the uh, reduction closed of the uh, ulnar humeral joint yeah now what? so so once the ulnar humeral joint is uh, reduced sometimes the, the fragment will fall back in place uh, and then you can, un under the CM guidance, you can use percutaneous screws to fix the the the, the lateral condyle. Okay. Uh, okay. What what configuration you want to use the screws in? So we uh, so can use two. So there are two separate fragments. Um, so can use one one screw. Um, so two screws in in the in the capitulum fragment. Which, okay. which can be headless screws and, and then uh, another screw in the, in, the, in the lateral epicondyle fragment. All right, okay. Your approach uh, when you're doing it, anything particular that you want to be careful about? I'm asking so, about the blood so, supply. So, uh, so I, I will try and do a limited uh, uh, la, 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 lateral approach when doing um, the... Um, so I will be worried about the... Um, where, where does the blood supply mostly come so, to this part? So, of the so my main concern would be for the, for the capitulum, which can, have, can cause avascular necrosis of the capitulum. Yes, um, what are you going to do to minimize that? So it comes from the, from the um, brachial artery, which is coming from, from medial to lateral side. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Sorry. We, we're going to stop there. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. So, how do you think you performed? Um, yeah, I, I, 
uh, I think um, I I did I, I was a bit focused on the on the, the fracture and I, I I think I I did mention that there is a posterior dislocation of the elbow um, but yes um, it could have been more more systematic and more sleek. That's fine. Okay, right. So your initial you know approach to the patient was fine. You took the history. Um, you did the examination and. In the examination part, you could see that it is obviously deformed there, that elbow, and the x-ray is showing exactly the same. And you can clearly, apart from, so sometimes, you know, there are features that we just get tunnel vision into. So we are always focusing on the obvious fracture, which is there. We're not looking at this part, which is also uh, subluxed or partially dislocated, okay? So um, ideally, we do not attempt in children of seven year old. We do not attempt any reduction in ED because of the you know uh, number one, it's unlikely to get reduced. Number two, it would be very painful and very distressing to the patient. So um, we we take the patient to theater. So that's that. Now coming to the um, aspect of, I mean, it took you a bit of time to get, because the, the, the type here immediately gives you a clue that there is a complex fracture, but there is also a ligamentous problem here because of the, you know, the dislocation here. So you need to, you know, come to the point of getting uh, further imaging rather uh, quickly, okay? Yeah. So initially CT scan was done, and this demonstrates the split there as well, and the fracture and, um, can see that's the ulna which is not congruent there. Now the question I asked was the blood supply. If you need to be aware, the posterior it is the posterior part which is where the uh, vascular supply is arranged. So we always try not to um, devitalize the soft tissues posteriorly. So your incision should be slightly more anterior if you can, and then the stripping of the soft tissues should be all on the anterior side rather than posterior and this is basically to avoid the risk of still it can happen but you know at least you have tried your best to minimize the risk of AVM. Yeah. Right okay and you talked we already talked about those um, you know divergent screw configuration so, so that's true. So would you, would you take the patient on, on the on the same same day? Yes because it's dislocated. Yeah. And if you don't reduce that, it will cause further problems in terms of increasing swelling, potential compartment syndrome, potential neurovascular compromise. Okay. okay. Thank you. One aspect is that if you don't have, I mean, we nowadays we, we, we do have the facility of CT scan available, I think, in every hospital. But the other uh, traditional option used to be the arthrogram. So you can do that intraoperatively, and that would outline the articular surface very well. So when, when, when you're shown the CT scan, would you say it is a capitulum and a lateral epicondyle? It's a lateral mass fracture, yes. A lateral mass fracture. fracture. Yeah. So, I mean, we're running slightly in a short on time, but um, had you come a bit early to the diagnosis with the imaging and, and we could have discussed about the potential complications of uh, this injury, but I think we're gonna move on now. Okay. Any, any burning questions for this case? Thank you. Okay. Well, right. uh, my question is this lateral epicondyle fracture is usually uh, inverted. The, the fragment is flipped. So do it need always open reduction? I think it could not be managed with closed reduction if the fragment right. is flipped. That's what exactly I did. So the unlateral joint got relocated after anesthesia. However, that fragment was not getting reduced. So many open approach, uh, as I said, laterally, but more anteriorly to avoid the vascular supply to the posterior elements, which is where the blood supply comes from. And then, you know, reducing it under direct vision. Okay. So who's next then? Yep, it's me. All right then. Okay, so this is your case. You got thirteen year old. Well, next. Yeah. Good answer, AJ. By the way. Thank you. All right. So, 
you're in clinic. You've got a, a, a six-year-old gentleman with bilateral hand problems. Um, he's come to you from the rheumatologists. So tell me what you're going to ask this gentleman. So I will, um, I will take a detailed history. I will ask about... Um, um, what's, in the detail, what's in your detailed history? I will, I will, I will, I will, ask, I will ask about whether any pain and if there is pain, what is the location, um, nature, what makes better, what makes worse? He's, in, he's got rheumatoid arthritis, he's in a lot of pain. Yeah, okay, and then yeah. I will um, assist the function of the hand, including grip as well as pinch. And you're um, away? What, what? You're right? still on history, aren't you? Sorry? It's a clinical, you're taking history. Tell me about what, what you want to know from asking, what questions you're gonna ask him. Yeah, I will. I will ask the patient about the fun, uh, function profile. Uh, to what extent this problem affect her daily activity? Uh, whether she's what daily activity? What, what daily activities are we going to ask? Him yeah, about? whether she's able to um, to use um, uh, brush to brush her hair or uh, uh, dressing or taking clothes off or uh, walking, driving. Um, and then I will assess, ask this patient about the, um, the swelling, whether the hand swelling up and what makes better for swelling, um, any um, in, uh, de deformities, when, when, where, whether she's compliant to medication or not, and uh, uh, to what extent the medication also um, to, um, improve her symptoms. And then um, I will assess for any other comorbidities um, uh, with the rheumatoid and what treatment is going. Is it DMARD or? Um, so on the D, he's on his DMARD medications, yeah. Yeah. Um, then I will um, I will assess the neurovascular status or uh, oh, sorry, I will ask about any numbness in the hand and um, I will conclude my um, history by. Asking patient what expectation she uh, she wants, um, with what occupation she's doing at the moment, if she does anything, and what she expects from the surgery if something um, she's going to undertake. At the moment, she's really frustrated. Well, he's really sorry. He's really frustrated because he struggles with buttons, particularly when he's doing his shirt buttons. Yeah, and. Uh, uh, okay, so I will. Um, so this he finds he's, he's, he's struggling to get his left hand, and particularly as he can't get his fingers straight anymore. Uh, okay, so I will. I will assess whether um, I will treat this patient, optimize the uh, his. Um, so tell me about your examination. What are you going to do when you're examining him? Okay, so um, I will. Since so the clinical picture shows. Um, I will assess the look for from the front as I can see there is um, radial uh, ulnar deviation of the metacarpal uh, with um, with I can't appreciate any cabot ulna probably in the right hand a bit com prominent compared to the left. Okay. There is no obvious uh, subluxation of the extensor tendon. I can see there is a um, swan. Uh, I, I will I will assist the middle finger in the right hand and the indi and the ring finger for um, botunier deformity. What's swan neck? Tell me how, what's swan necking? So, um, swan neck is um, is um, a hyperextension of the PIB with flexion of the DIB. Okay. And um, I can say again. Why do you get swan neck? What, what, what causes swan it neck is in the rheumatoid? Usually imbalance um, of the tendon, uh, of the uh, flexor and extensor, or intrinsic tightness. In this, it it's, could be many reasons, but um, usually in the in the rheumatoid hand, it related to subluxation um, volarly of the of the lateral band, okay. and and um, which is and you notice as well that you said about the ulnar deviation of fingers. And when yeah. you notice the patient's trying to straighten his, his fingers, he, he struggles to get them straight. 
Why might that be? This usually as a result of von Jackson uh, deformity could be. What's von uh, Jackson could be, deformity? It could be so. It could be uh, attrition of the EDC tendons or attrition or rupture of ED of uh, ECU as well. Okay. The sensor so can be an You can see the tendons though still there. What other things could be stopping the fingers from extending properly? It, it's it to mostly, in, in early, it mostly could be synovitis of the metacarbopharyngeal joints. Mm -hmm. um, that um, as an inflammatory process going on that affects the function of the okay. uh, joints. Uh, Why are you drifting be... out to the side? Say again? Why are you drifting on the leg? Yeah, or it could be that the extensor tendon drifted on because of the sagittal band rupture. Okay, good. All right. So tell me, um, what special test were you going to do for this patient? Because you, you talked about testing function earlier. Yes, I will do a grip function. Um, um, so what types will, of grips? What types sorry, of grips I, will, I will assess the function by grip, uh, like uh, doorknob up to assess whether patients can do doorknob or not. I uh, will assess the uh, bench, side bench, as well as uh, side bench or, and um, pencil pinch and uh, uh, chuck pinch as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I will check um, for, um, I will assess for intrinsic tightness by panel test. And I will do also for in other deformities, I can't appreciate any uh, boutonniere deformity. If there is, I will do a uh, Elson test as well. Okay, good. Right. All right. So you're going to get some x-rays? Yes? Yes, please. Yeah. What can you see here on these x-rays? Um, so the x-ray shows um, uh, degenerative changes in the meta uh, and um, metacarbophalangeal joints significantly with also PIB. So it's significant generative changes globalized in the most of the hand joints. Okay. Uh, there is ulnar sub translocation, mild ulnar translocation of the carbus. Um, I can't okay. see what significant. What do, you tell me, what do you tell me think about the MCPJ joints? Are they, are they right? No, there is, um, 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 it's, 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 it's almost fused or degenerative changes of the MCP with subluxation as well. Okay, fusion, do you say? No, I mean degenerative, like, and, oh. like articular are surface they, are erosion. They, are they in joint or are they subluxed? They looks like subluxed. Okay. Dorsal right. subluxation technically. So, so the patient saying he's, he's struggling to extend his fingers. You can see there's a bit of subluxation of the MCPJs. So uh, what, what, what's your sort of differentials as to why he's got these problems with his hand? You can see the tendons trying to move, but when it comes to MCPJs, they're not wanting to extend very much. Um, so because of, I think, um, the degenerative change of the joint itself or in inflammatory process with significant synovitis in the joints that affect the range of motion of the joints as well. What other investigations do you do to help you? Um, other investigation. Um, I'm not sure. I will, uh, I will just the clinical to assess if there is any tendon rupture or attrition of the tendons. Well, well, you're uh, examining him, the tendons appear to be intact, they're not ruptured, but they are, they are subluxed out into the, out to the ulnar side. Yeah, which is, I will do MRI to assess the sagittal band, okay. whether it, it is rupture or not, which in case I will consider reconstruction of sagittal band. Okay. Right, okay, so tell me about your management options then. What, what, what are your management options for this gentleman? So the options are um, non-operative management, including um, uh, MEDT approach that include um, um, 
physiotherapy uh, activity modification, uh, modif um, uh, optimizing the medical treatment, um, uh, orthotics. Uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. All right. So, um, and you have to focus on a specific problem, which he's talking about. Yeah, and then individualize yeah. each problem as per the function of each. So, I'm not going to treat all of the problems here. It depends on the function itself. Yeah. Good. Okay. All right. Sorry, I'll, I'll show you the way short on time is that. So, well done. So, how did that go for you? It's like kind of like I don't know. It's sometimes hard to rheumatoid. It's lots of things, but I'm not sure. Yeah, so obviously I should talk about C spine. Yeah. All right, don't worry. Okay. So rheumatoid. It's a large topic. So rheumatoid hand scares everyone because you think you have so much to, to talk about. Focus on one problem. You did that right. You asked the patient what their concerns are, what their expectations are. Okay. So he, this guy's. He's trying to do his buttons because his fingers can't extend properly. He's struggling to do them. So you've got to think about why these fingers are not extending. So you did, yeah, you talk about pain, talk about functional assessment, activity of daily living, C-spine, don't worry so much, yeah. But it is important. The anaesthetist wants to know if they're going to take, put them to sleep, they're going to break their neck. Previous interventions and obviously disease modifying uh, uh, um, anti-rheumatic drugs. Okay, so that's the key thing in history. And you, you, we mentioned all those. Don't worry, speed C spine. Think about it for next time round. Yep. Good. Basic steps: look, feel, move. Hopefully, you will identify most pathologies. Look for areas of tenderness. Assess any abnormal tissues or swelling. So you will find it's a bit boggy where the sagittal bands have have, have had an attrition, and passive movement of the joints, stability of the joints, and we will find that actually because of the subluxation, those MCPs are subluxing. Okay, so not, they're not stable. Yeah. And tendon function. So tendons are actually will function fine. So Vaughan Jackson happened a bit later on. If you ignore it, this end up this will end up having Vaughan Jackson. So when we allowed to see patients who go through the exam, <laughs> this is what we suggested you should have in your pocket. So to help do with the functional functional tests. So a pen, a key, and a, a, a coin. So picking up the coin. So and you mentioned the five key, so lateral pinch grip, end pinch grip, which you mentioned, power grip, which you mentioned, chuck grip, and hook grip as well. Those are the, if, you, if they want you to examine the rheumatoid hands, those are the five things you should, those are the five functional things you should think about, okay? Um, because you, can't, you don't have time to do a full exam of the hand. Look, feel, move, and get them to do those power grips as best as you can. Okay, it's something we all need to, we have to practice to get as thick as we can and able to do it within a few minutes. Okay, but it is possible. All right. But I like your approach, management principles for rheumatoid is really difficult. You, you've, got, you've got to assess the whole patient with an MDT approach, optimize medical management, OT physio, focus on the main issue. We can't treat everything. If we try to treat everything, we, we lose. So, non operative injection splint, you mentioned those, good. Operative, on this situation, but you're focusing in terms of in general, we're talking about rheumatoid. Um, we might think of wrist arthrodesis if they've got problems with the carpus, centralization procedures, satchel band procedures, lateral band reconstructions, like in swan necking, which I was very impressed with. The examiner will try asking you what swan neck is, what boutonnieres is, why they for happen. And obviously, with a subluxation, you can also possibly think of MCPJ replacements if they've got arthritis there. But you wouldn't necessarily to do that in this gentleman you would struggle because of the instability around those joints. They would, they would fail. So you need to do something about the sagittal bands. So as a double edge. So what, what, what arthrodesis options we can consider except of wrist arthrodesis? Is any other yeah. finger we can do? You, you can, so PIPJ, so you, you, you would fuse the PIP, you could fuse the DIPJs, you could replace the PIPJs. Occasionally, you can fuse the PRPJs. Um, MCPJs, you would try and um, replace, but mostly wrist fusion. If you're talking about some of the, if, if, you, if they've got severe capital only, you could do your squad capangis. You've got all these lovely different ones you could try. But ultimately, the most predictable one in terms of outcome is a, is a fusion, sadly. Yeah. But it, it does take a lot of counseling for a patient to get 
to that stage. The good thing for the good thing is that medications are so are so best, much better. We rarely see rheumatoid patients, but when we do, they've got these quite complex issues where their fingers are subluxing and they're struggling with function with with functional live, functional activities. And so we focus. The key thing is to focus on those. Okay. Yeah. But yes, now otherwise, a good approach is lab. Good approach. Okay. They're very difficult with rheumatoid hands. Um, as I say, there's lots to go on, and there's always lots to see. There's lots to talk about. Uh, I think you did. Yeah, I, 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 I was happy with your approach there. I know I've hurried you along because of time. Okay, and knowing that, I apologise. We, we have overrun, but well done. Well done. Thank you. All Thank right. you very much, David. That was excellent. And obviously, clinicals they do they do drag on. That's the nature of it because of that. A lot more interactions and questions. And um, so, but that was really great. Uh, very good cases. Thank you very much, David, for all the effort you put into uh, for this session. My pleasure. All right. Good luck, everyone, good. next week. Good to have you. Thank you very much, uh, David. I think, um, yeah, have a nice Easter. Good. Thank you. Okay, guys, now we'll move on to the last station. Uh, Abid, please. Um, so we have a, this last station today is lower limb clinicals. You must be all guys exhausted, but I think it's good to build up the stamina and the resilience for the exam and stay focused to the end. Uh, sure. Thank you. Thanks for us. So, sorry, a bit about the delay. Uh, no so problem. We'll That's start. Yeah, I can see okay. Can you just, in one word, tell me what the problem is here? Uh, this is a plantar valgus deformity involving okay. the right lower limb. So okay, tell me the etiology of the plantar valgus foot. What could be the potential causes? So it uh, could be uh, post-traumatic uh, with uh, having had fractures in the midfoot. It could be uh, uh, tibial tendon posterior tibial tendon insufficiency. Uh, other things would be uh, diabetic with a, a charcoal foot and they could end up with a rocker bottom foot. Uh, other things would be uh, inflammatory arthropathies we could also cause that, uh, infection and metabolic. Anything more? So these all you mentioned and, and uh, they are all acquired ones, aren't they? Anything yeah. before? Oh, of course. Um, so yeah, there there are the uh, congenital ones that yeah. give way a a fixed flat foot deformity, such as your congenital vertical talus, and uh, uh, I think it's a, a, a coalition, tarsal yeah. coalition. Okay, well done. Okay, so this lady comes to you complaining of pain and ongoing difficulty with her gait. And this is the picture that you see. How do you want to proceed? To take relevant history to start with. So I would uh, want to ask her how long the uh, pain has been going on for. For about a year now. And was it precipitated by any uh, injuries or any... No. Uh, in inflammations within the foot? She doesn't know what inflammation means. Oh, so did she, have any, did she have any episodes of redness and swelling and pain? No. The proceeding? No. Okay. And no injuries. Okay. And uh, ask her if the, uh, if she's had long-standing uh, loss of her arch or whether she's, uh, gradually developed this deformity? She thinks it's, it's gradual, so symptoms are worsening uh, gradually. Okay, I would want to know uh, what kind of effects the symptoms are having on her, her lifestyle and her... So she notices some weakness, she cannot go on her tiptoes there, and generally she has pain on the inner side of her foot. Okay, is she finding that this is uh, causing it, making it difficult to to walk or long distances, walk on yes. uneven ground? She struggles to walk. 
Okay, and uh, her age and occupation? She is an office worker and she is 45. Okay, and uh, does, uh, does she smoke? No. Does she take any uh, medications, steroid medications? Or no, anything? she's otherwise fit and well. Okay, and uh, what are her hobbies in terms of her, her overall sporting activities? She doesn't get involved in sport activities. So no jogging and, and nothing else? Okay. No. All right. Um, what are her expectations? So she wants to get rid of her symptoms, which is mainly pain and difficulty in walking. Okay. All right. Um, I think at this stage, uh, and she has she ever had any previous surgery to the foot? No. No. Okay. And uh, yeah, and no neurological, so no numbness or tingling or anything like that. No. Okay. Uh, can I move it on to the examination? Okay. What are you going to, to do? The focus relevant examination here. So I will first uh, assess her gait. So she has got the entalgic uh, uh, gait there on the right side. Okay. And uh, I would want to. Uh, see her single leg he, uh, tip stance, whether she can go on tiptoe on single leg. She cannot. Okay. And uh, so then I would want to uh, lie her down. And I'd assess her bathing school actually while she's standing as well. That's normal. Okay. I would then lie her down so that I can examine the foot. I would uh, want to check if there's tenderness on the medial aspect of the foot over the, uh, the post tendon. She has tenderness there. Okay, and uh, I would want to see um, also then if I, the deformity is, uh, if the arch is reconstructible when I do a Jack's test. So it is not. Okay, and uh, I want to then assess if uh, if this is a a correctable deformity in terms of the uh, the hind foot valgus and the forefoot uh, a deduction whether that correct. So how are you gonna check that? Yeah. So uh, for the hind foot valgus, I will want to invert the heel and see if that's correct. And then I will see if the uh, forefoot remains, uh, uh, whether the forefoot remains supinated or whether it, it uh, corrects when I invert the heel. So, it, so there is a picture there. That's how the foot is like when she tries to, when, when you try to bring the hind foot into neutral position. So the forefoot remains supinated. Okay, all right, so that means it's uh, that stiffness there. All right, and uh, and then I want to test for uh, to be honest, posterior uh, strength as well. So I will put the position of the foot in a inverted position, and then I will ask her to push against my hand to try and maintain that inverted position. Okay, all right, so she can do that, but with struggle okay okay and uh, so so describe to me this mm -hmm. uh, hind foot and forefoot rotation in relation to each other in this particular problem so you've got a hind foot valgus deformity and your, that is causing the medial uh, aspect of the forefoot and midfoot to uh, to be in contact with the ground. And in order for the lateral foot to make contact with the ground, it needs to supinate in response to to bring the, the, those rays to the the lateral rays to the ground. Okay. What are the structures that maintain the medial arch of the foot? 
So the medial arch is maintained by the uh, tibialis posterior as well as the uh, peroneus longus and uh, uh, some input from the, uh, the uh, plantar fascia. Anything else? And the uh, spring ligament, which, okay. yeah. And that, and that runs from where to where, the spring ligament? That runs from the uh, sustentaculum tali to the navicular. Okay, there. all right, okay. So let's proceed now. So you have now established her clinical findings. What next? So then I would move on to getting radiographs. Uh, uh, lateral and uh, AP radiograph, standing radiographs. Okay. So and, uh, I don't have them, but uh, it's, it's done and that basically shows um, best planners. So what exactly are you trying to find from the x-rays? So from the x-ray, I will be looking at the subtalar joint for, for degenerative changes there. And I'd also want to be looking for uh, tailor tilt of the uh, tailor tilt on the AP view. Okay. And as well as uh, the uh, Mary's angle and the calcaneal pitch. Okay. All right. Tell me about Mary's angle. What, what is exactly it is? Yeah. So that is uh, the long axis of the tailors and the long axis of the first ray, which should uh, be if not parallel within five degrees of each other. And if it's uh, deranged in either direction, you can either have a clavus or a plan. plan. Yeah, okay. Now coming to the treatment options, what are the surgical options here? So uh, surgical options, if there is a- The uh, x-rays didn't show any arthritis. Okay. But it does clearly show the best planus deformity. So then you could be considering a uh, a reconstruction, uh, a transfer of uh, the F, the flexor digitorum longus tendon to tibialis posterior to uh, reconstruct to yeah reconstruct the. Okay. You won't you won't reverse the uh, the deformity. Okay. So you're gonna do a tendon transfer of FHL transfer. or FDL. Yeah. Anything yeah. else? Uh, other than that, uh, you'd want to consider uh, uh, a not fixed yeah. situated four foot deformity as yeah. incorrect behind foot. Then you'd want to consider a. Uh, lengthening of the lateral column of calcaneum in order to uh, correct the abduction of the forefoot and yeah and that will correct in that plane and uh, so what uh, we can do to the forefoot because if you correct the hind foot by transferring the tendon then the forefoot would remain still supinated and it will not provide her with a plantigrade gait. Yeah. Okay, no problem. We're going to stop there. Thank you. Uh, well done, Andrew. I think uh, you, you, know, you approached this uh, very uh, systematically. I think you just got slightly a bit confused in the, in the treatment options. They are not easy uh, and they have, you know, especially this feel of foot and ankle when we are not very much uh, seeing all these cases on a routine basis becomes slightly you know, confusing. However, your approach was uh, very good. So you started with identifying the problem straight away. Um, you could simply add it saying that this is too many toe sign, which is present in, you know, um, plantar valgus foot. Uh, etiology wise, you've mentioned pretty much all of them. Uh, so don't forget about the congenital causes as well. So vertical talus and uh, some neuromuscular causes like uh, cerebral palsy, uh, tarsal coordination you mentioned. Okay. 
And you've mentioned about the examination, so you've got a very clear concept of how those two elements, the hind foot and the forefoot, um, act in relation to each other as the deformity progresses. Coming to the investigations, we talked about them very um, perfectly, no issues. Do you know the, the, the treatment by classification? So there are four stages, and you, and you basically manage according to that stage of the uh, deformity or the condition. So here's the summary. So you see that picture of the foot, which is after correction of the hind foot, the forefoot is supinated. So that great toe or the medial ray would not touch the ground. And it is essential to have it touching on the ground, isn't it? Yeah, are you with me so far? Yes. Yeah. So what you do, you do a, an osteotomy, um, what we call it as a cotton osteotomy, and that's to plantar flex the, 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 the first uh, ray so that it is touching. And that's basically on the category of the stage 2C where the forefoot is supinated. So this is a summary you can see by stages, and you do the treatment accordingly. Yeah, I, I, okay. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. That's fine. It just, I think this, uh, this is very well um, uh, described in the in the Miller book. If you go there, it's just uh, in a stage wise fashion, so it's very clear. But they can ask you, if, uh, you know, about this. This is a common uh, case that can be presented in the exam. Any questions so far on this? Okay, let's move on to the third case then. Thank you. Yeah, next one um, is candidate uh, number four, Gulam. Okay, Gulam. So we have a female patient. She fell.